I found an old, old poster. It sits back in this case back in the back of the room here. And I uh, didn't think much of it, but later when I got looking at it, I realized it was kind of a unique piece. And it was part of a federal poster series that was actually made by the WPA. And we'll talk, I'll give you all the history of this in a minute, but uh, the, uh, the poster followed me home to college. It was going to the burn pile. We were cleaning out the old Beaver Creek uh, corrals, and, and so everything went in the, in the truck, and, and, and I fished this thing out at the last minute. And got think, you know, it took me about 20 years to really figure out what was going on with this thing. But anyway, that, that, that's uh, back in the 1970s. The Park Service is half as old as it is today. And uh, my goal is to, to find the 14 original prints. There were only 14 made. Uh, they were made about 100 copies each, so about 1,400. And I want to hang a reproduction in every home in America. I want people to know what the WPA and the CCC contributed to our national parks and state parks. And uh, let's see, I'm, I'm really a dentist. Uh, I worked in Alaska for the last 15 years in public health. Um, I was a dentist in Antarctica for a year and um, <clears throat> had a lot of fun, fun uh, with dentistry over the last 35 years. I'm a for-profit company. I give this talk to in national parks as a guest speaker. Uh, I was asked to give a motivational talk for Shell Oil Company uh, last year, which is kind of unusual, and, and, but it was really interesting. And, and, uh, but anyway, I'm a for-profit company. I work with the national park bookstores, a wholesale retail relationship. I'm one of the oldest products in the park now. 26 years we've been republishing the set slowly and, and embellishing it. And uh, we get 1% of our gross income back our total net sales back to the national parks to restore and curate WPA and CCC art and architecture. And I'll show you a few projects that we're, we're doing. If you want to uh, learn more about me or forget something I've said today, you can always go to rangerdug.com. There's some cards and, and whatnot in the back of the room, and there's all the history that I'm going to talk about today is a little more succinctly put um, on the website. But about two years ago, well, this is, this is the 1% project here. You have to excuse me, but I re rearranged my slides a bit uh, for the Grand Teton last night. This is one of the 1% projects. This is at Calavera State Park in California. They were going to tear these fireplaces down and put in some who knows what. And uh, the, some of the people there in the park called me up and said, uh, would you help us out? And we want to rebuild rather than destroy these, these old fireplaces. So th these were built by the CCC and, and rebuilt about uh, six, seven years ago. And this is my, uh, I live in Alaska, so I'm going to give you two slides of Alaska, start and finish. I live on this tugboat, it's 1899, it's the oldest running boat in the, on the West Coast. And I've been twice to Alaska, and I'm trying to get it on the National Historic Register. Eventually I'm going to try to get it in a museum. This is my commute, I don't know what your commute's like. My commute this morning was terrible. <laughs> it took me 15 minutes to drive down the hill and drive up to the museum here. Okay, so... Let's start from the beginning here. Actually, let's start from the other end of the beginning. Two years ago, the person on the upper right there, uh, Jason Jurgen, asked me to, he, he got wind of this project that I was doing, this restoration project, and the uh, Department of the Interior Museum had been closed for six years due to lack of funding. And they decided to open it up. They got some funding for it. And uh, he called me up and said, we'd like to put all your posters up including a, as many originals as we can find, and, and I was just at the time acquiring a couple more. There, that one and one in the case back there. So for 12 months we had an exhibit at Interior Museum, and it was opened by Sally Jewell. They extended it for two more months. We had 16,000 people come in and out, which for a little hole in the wall museum that nobody's even heard of, it was pretty, pretty popular. Meantime, NPR, um, LA Times, a bunch of other media got a hold of this thing, and it's kind of been snowballing since. So I went to the director of the Park Service, John Jarvis, whom I knew from Mount Rainier days, and asked if he could take this on the road for the centennial. It would be just kind of a perfect centennial thing, in my opinion, my own humble opinion. Well, he, he didn't have a budget for it. And so the bottom line is I'm doing this privately. So I'm here before you today as a private citizen. I'm at 27,000 miles. I'm on my second car. I'm towing a 1948 Airstream. Yeah. And this is my 44th talk. So... This is the story of how these prints got, got into the uh, secretary's office. There's one hanging uh, just above uh, Tracy Bates, this woman here, and she's a curator. And behind there is a, I don't know if you have the one on the wall of the interior. I don't see it. But we actually made a poster for this interior exhibit. And we got permission to use the seal, 1937 seal, on this 1937 poster, which is kind of unique. <clears throat> so here I'm explaining the, the, this is the exhibit. And Sally Jewell uh, opened the exhibit on... I think the 6th of April, 2014, had 48 prints in the exhibit. I think there's 30 here. 
So this represents about two-thirds of the artwork that I've done. This was the uh, Interior Department uh, uh, poster that we made for this exhibit. And how many people have been in the Interior Department building? Got a couple hands here. I really suggest you go. It is a museum unto itself. It has a museum within it. Nobody knows that. Um, that's why NPR put it up on their morning edition, because it, it's kind of a little gem. And um, the, the building itself, though, was built in a year and a half by the PWA, per Publics, Public Works Administration. There's a whole alphabet soup I'll get into in a minute. But the PWA built this building in 18 months, start to finish. It's on, it has two city blocks, a footprint of seven football fields, has 4,000 offices, more or less. Every office has a window to the outside. Ickes wanted his, his uh, workers, his employees, to be happy and enjoy coming to work. He put an ice cream parlor on the roof, and he put a basketball court down in the basement. And it's, it's an amazing building. Uh, if you can get there, they have little tours of it. It's in right downtown on the mall in Washington, D.C. Every doorknob on the building back in the 30s had a bison head, brass cast bison head. They made cast 3,300 of these doorknobs, and today only 55 are remaining in the building. Mm -hmm. So they've walked out as souvenirs, retirement gifts, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I, I bring this up because it really t it tells a story of why these posters are so rare. These are made of paper, they're not brass. And so these are, this is kind of why I'm up in, in, in talking to you today, uh, let, let you know we've got to hold on to our history a little bit better. Here's the brass escalators, brass elevators in the building. The, this is the ice cream parlor. They have WPA Native American artists come in and they painted a whole series of murals around the room from all different Indian nations around the country. It's, it's uh, worth, the, worth going to see. On the roof of the building, I should mention this, on the roof of the building, they put, in World War II, put two gun emplacements, one in each end of the building to, to uh, defend the building, I guess. They're an anti-aircraft gun. And when they were cleaning one, some period during the war, it discharged and it blew the W off the word Wisconsin on the, on the Lincoln Memorial. And that was the only shot fired domestically in World War II in the United States. And by the way, the, it took one year for Congress to get the light bulbs for, this, for that exhibit. <laughs> so we're slowing down a bit. So in 1987, a book came out by Christopher Denoon, and it was co-authored by Henry Vizcarra. And uh, I can't remember who wrote the foreword on it, but... Uh, Christenun and Henry Vizcarra and this third, he was an academic, got wind of 1,700 posters in these crates. It was kind of a rumor. And so they went up in the University of Maryland library. It's up in a tour and up in an attic. It was kind of like looking at King Tut's tomb. And they found 1,700 posters. And before that, there were only about 300 known. So the total amount of WPA art in 1987 that was known were 2,000 prints there were 35,000 designs. But back between 1935 and 1943, the WP Art Project, the Poster Division, noted that there were 35,000 designs made, 2 million prints. So 2 million in 19, between 1938 and 1945. So 2,000 today is one tenth of 1%. So we've lost 99.9% .9 of our public poster art. It's gone forever. And so again, that's why I think this message should be told, of the 35,000 designs, only 14 were national parks. So a very, very small part of this whole poster project was national parks. And what happened was World War II came up and the whole thing stopped. The posters were thrown out. They were ephemera. They, for 50 years, nobody knew a thing about them until I found one in Grand Teton Park in the barn. And even for another 25 years, it sat up in Seattle on my wall. I still didn't know what it was. It was 1993 that I really started delving into this. I'm going to go through a couple of books here, publications, and there's some literature in the back, and this is also on my website, but this is the current read writing of that book by Ennis Carter, Posters for the People. Beautiful book. It's got all the WPA National Park art. This is a book by Albert Good, who was first published in 1938. It was actually the second edition, and he was asked to put the architecture in one volume. And this is really the Bible that where our national parks, uh, this is the architectural Bible that of our national park architecture. This is the original edition. And the inside of the book, you can see these beautiful schematics and diagrams that the CCC and the WPA used to uh, build the park architecture, I call it. I use this plan here to build an outdoor kitchen in Alaska, which is great. Here's another organization I want to just inform you about. Uh, Kathy Flynn was the Deputy Secretary of the State of New Mexico. And she, during her uh, 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 service in New Mexico, she noted a lot of these WPA buildings were 75 years old, 
and they're starting to decay and they're being torn down. And with them, the artwork that's integral to the building was also being destroyed. So she started curating this art, trying to repurpose it, remove it if she could, or restore the buildings. And so this is, she's trying to import this to all 50 states, and uh, this is a Texas book that just came out uh, on their mission in, in Texas. This is Fort Davis. I just went down and visited this building here. If, if, you, if you go around the country, keep an eye on, the, on the, what the CCC did. Virtually many of the state parks have, have wonderful, wonderful buildings that were all built by 18 to 25 year olds. It was uh, three million of them in eight years. Here's the last book I want to talk about. This just came out. Al, Al Renty, uh, he published a book on the railroads and their posters as well. And more, it was more about the, 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 uh, the railroads really opened up our national parks before automobiles. So the, the posters were made, of course, to entice people to visit the parks. It kind of parallels what, what I'm doing. Beautiful book. So here I am. I'm going to turn the sound off. because Let's see. How do I do that? Maybe I should not. I'm not sleeping dogs lie here. Okay, I, this is where I worked as a ranger. who was in a barn like this. It's just the one that's south at Beaver Creek that I fished this old poster. Um, this is, I spent seven years here in Grand Teton. They were the best seven years of my life. And when I got here, I, I, I ran into uh, Cornelia Abercrombie out in Kelly. I'll mention some names because some of you are probably locals. But Cornelia was my great aunt. I didn't know that. She was actually my aunt once removed. And, and uh, they had a 3,000 acre ranch here in the valley. And I'd always heard that I had an uncle that had a ranch out in the west somewhere. You know, and I th thought, well, it was two acres of hard scrabble and a little yeah. mule or a donkey somewhere. No, it was 3,000 acres in the center of Jackson Hole. <laughs> And here's the Jenny Lake where I work. The poster back here is Jenny Lake Museum. We're, gonna, we're getting close to that. But that, this is what I did. I worked in Mountain Rescue seven years. And I actually got inside a helicopter and took off in the air. It was built by somebody in his backyard with an erector set. Here's the Jenny Lake Museum. This is the building commemorated by that poster. This building uh, today stands. It's uh, now a ranger station again. It's have been repurposed several times. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about the building and the poster here in a minute. So here's the poster that's back in the back of the room. I found three of these. There were 100 made, so I found three. And they're all three in this valley today. Two are in the park right now, and I tried to get them here. I thought it'd be kind of fun. But I do have photographs of them. But th this hung in my room in, in, uh, in the, up at Jenny Lake. Went home to college with me. And 20 years later, Charlene Milligan called me up. She ran the bookstore here in Grand Teton, and her, her husband was my boss, uh, Tom Milligan. And she said, well, we're moving the Jenny Lake Museum off the moraine over to the other side. It's clean up the shoreline. It's an ecological move, and we want to commemorate it because it's an historic building and make a poster and sell it. She said, do you have any good ideas since you worked in that building for so many years? So I said, well, do, do I have a good idea? I've got the poster. So here it is. So I sent her a picture of it, and she, and she says, uh, we'll send it down here. We'll, we'll make some copies of it. And I said, no, 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 that's not going to work. And I was really afraid that it was going to, again, disappear. So Charlene and I worked a deal out where I would uh, reproduce the poster. We made about 600 of them, I believe, and I think we sold them for $20. I remember losing my shirt on the deal, but it made a little money for the park. And the second time around, the second edition, when we ran out, I went to Charlene and I said, well, let's do it again. And she said, no, we've kind of done that. We're going to move on and do something else. And I said, well, i got an idea. Let's make up a Yellowstone poster. I'll just make one up. I'll get an artist, and I'll show you what I'll do. And, get it all approved, and then we'll sell them side by side. And we'll not only sell 1,200, we'll sell 1,800 because it's sales potentiate. So I did this, and I hired an artist, and I made up some Yellowstone geyser, uh, Old Faithful prints. And uh, just before I, I sent it to my printer, which is the expensive part, you have to do all the screen building, I thought, you know, I better do my homework. And so I called Charlene back, and I said, what do you know about this Teton poster? She said, oh, I know it's a federal poster. I said, well, I'll call the Library of Congress, and they only have three in their collection. So uh, where do I go? And she said, well, try Harper's Ferry. They're a archive in, the, in, uh, in uh, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. So I called up Harper's Ferry, and I talked to a fellow named Tom Durant. And Tom was kind of incredulous because uh, he said, you know, it's funny you're calling. He said, I got a letter on my desk from Grand Canyon, and I dug up 13 black and white photographs of old posters. And uh, I said, well, does it say meet the ranger at the top of this Grand Canyon poster? He said, no, it doesn't say anything. I said, do you have Grand Canyon print there in these black and white photographs? He said, yeah, I've got, I've got one. I said, read it to me. He said, it says, meet the ranger naturalist at Jenny Lake Museum. So this was the holy grail that I've been looking for for about 25 years. Not really intensely, but 
all of a sudden, this was, all, I took no, got in the next airplane, got a speeding ticket driving out to uh, Harper's Ferry, met with Tom, I called uh, Kim Bukite in, in uh, Grand Canyon because she was the one that was trying to get the provenance of their Grand Canyon print. And I looked at all the photographs and, and uh, uh, Tom and I got to show them the reproduction we did with the Jenny Lake one and had a, had a great chat. But I, anyway, I walked out to a phone booth in, in, uh, right out front of Harper's Ferry and, and uh, called Kim Bukite up and I asked her, I said, well, where are you in this process of reproducing posters? She said, well, we gave up on it. Too expensive. So in that instant, in my mind, in my head, I, I, I always tell everybody, I walked into that phone booth with a mild-mannered dentist, a bespectacled dentist, and I came out as Ranger Doug Ranger of the Lost Art. And I said to Kim, I said, oh, I have a company in Seattle, and we reproduce these old silk screen prints, and let me send you a sample. So I sent her the, the Jenny Lake one. So Grand Canyon and I had an agreement that with the, I republished their poster for them. And so we took this apart. The Grand Canyon is over here on the wall to the right. And you'll see it up on the screen here in a minute. But these are the, these, uh, that's kind of how this whole thing started. It, it occurred in about five minutes. <clears throat> these are the black and white photos I had to work with. Now, this was not a trivial thing to do. This, well, I had all the information here. I did not have color. So I'm working from black and white photos. What happened was in 1951, after World War II, they cleaned out the Western Museum Laboratories. It's in an old bank building in Berkeley. All, all the materials went over to, the, to the, uh, the old Mint building in San Francisco, which was a federal archive at the time. And then when that closed, they sent all the remaining posters back to the national parks. Took photographs of everything in 1951. That was the last time anybody had seen these. That poster that was sent back is very likely this one back here. I, don't, I can't prove it, but that's probably where it came from. Anyway, I had my work cut out for me. Here's Mount Rainier. You see the whole right-hand side is virtually gone. At the very bottom here, you can just barely see made, in, made by WPA CCC. I missed that on the first edition. Uh, and I wasn't looking for it. So... Here's the Grand Canyon. Now, fortunately, we had a Grand Canyon print, because that's why Grand Canyon wrote. So I could actually use that color print. And let's talk about where, where the idea came from. This is, I initially thought this was the second one printed, and it's not. Uh, the reason I thought that is because it's four color, which it's not. It's a Haynes photograph. Um, it's four color and it's uh, Yellowstone and Grand Teton are kind of you know, related parts geographically. But that's not what happened. So this is made by, let me get my little pointer out. This, this it has a three lobe uh, geyser uh, profile. And this, this was based on a photograph taken by F.J. Haynes. And this was taken in 1904. Um, next uh, week I give 12 talks at the Haynes studio in Yellowstone. And it's from that studio where this photograph came from, 1904. Haynes, F.J. Haynes uh, was a buddy of Phyllis Norris. He was a second superintendent of, of uh, Yellowstone. There were really no good photography, photographers or photography of Yellowstone Park. Mo the, the reason the park was set up was based on uh, expeditions, uh, paintings from artists. And they were so surreal that I think Congress had a hard time buying this. And so somebody said, we've got to get some real facts here. And so Norris, uh, Norris uh, encouraged um, uh, F.J. Haynes to go up into Yellowstone. In 1881, he set up, a, by 1884, he set up a studio. He went up in 1881. This, this stuff, as I said, was taken about 1904. Probably one of the most iconic photographs. The uh, Union Pacific Railway used it. Same profile. F, uh, FDR was a stamp collector. He's called a lot of names, by the way. One of them was a philatelist. He was a stamp collector. And he, he got busted for stamp gate. Nobody knows that, but he was, he was initialing his signature on the bottom of, of unperforated stamp sheets and, and passing them out to his friends. And uh, he got his hand slapped for that. Today, we do, it's not stamps that we do that. Uh, anyway, this is the, uh, here's the stamp set. This one was based on a Haynes photograph. This one, I don't know who the photographer, but this is also the, the person that made the, the uh, WPA poster. And I, is Zion here? I think it is somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we are. This is my colorations, which are different um, than the original one, but this, this is based on the same photograph, and also the Yosemite was based on the same photograph. The rest of these are, are not WPA related. So these are the colors that it actually came out to be, uh, as you can see in the back of the room. If you look very carefully, the initials EM here. And EM was a screen printer. 
and I'm going through a roster of, of CCC and WPA artists right now, CCC worker, worker bees, looking for somebody with EM. I found one, his name is Edward Monk, and he worked at the, at the, uh, at the uh, Western Museum Labs. And so uh, I should know within a couple of days. I was trying to hopefully get the information. This is, a, this is the coloration I made up. Uh, working from black and white, I had no idea. But Haynes and I kind of thought alike. We, we used reds, blues, yellows. Um, this was obviously the, from the photograph, and this is the artwork, probably the WPA artist used to create the, the Yellowstone print. That's a 1937 guidebook. So in that, where, where did this project start? Uh, August 26, 1938, Dory Yeager, he was the... He was the assistant chief of the museum division at the Western Museum Labs, wrote Boss Pinkley. Uh, Frank Pinkley was the superintendent at Southwest Monuments. He was in Coolidge, Arizona, which I think is your state, and later moved to the Southwest building, Southwest Park headquarters in Santa Fe, the old Santa Fe building, which today is still standing, and it's, a, it's the largest secular CCC building that the, that the CCC built. I'm working right now with Kathy Flynn and other people in Congress to try to make this a national monument and then they get funding to keep it open for the public. Right now it's close to the public, but it's a real shame. It's a, it is a museum as well. But anyway, Pinkley received this letter from uh, Dory Yeager. He said, we're going to make posters, order a lot of them, because we, we have to destroy the screens, and they're 12 cents a piece, $12 per hundred. And he said, here's a sample, and it's the Grand Teton, all parks. Mm. So this is the first one made, and he said, this is more or less an experiment. It does not in any way represent what the best of this process, and we can do much better, and especially the lettering. Well, the Grand Teton lettering is the best of them all, so somebody at the WPA dropped the ball. Who knows? But anyway, this is, a, this is an interesting letter to find because this is really the genesis of the whole project. August 26, 1938. Now, that, when the, the poster project, the, the, there's books on this now, but it started actually with Mayor LaGuardia in New York City, about 19, right after the stock market crash in probably 1929 or 30. And in New York, everybody was drinking too much, and they were gambling, and they were up to no good. And so Mayor LaGuardia said, I'm going to have a fish Tuesday. I'm going to get everybody out fishing on Tuesday. And he had a couple other anti-gambling posters. So to make these posters to advertise his, his works, he would get 50 artists in a room. And he would put one poster on the wall and say, copy this poster. And so he'd have 50 artists, 50 different styles, but it all had the same message. Well, one of these guys in the room was Anthony Valonis. He, he figured out that... that that he figured out that he could make a kind of a rat trap press. He automated the system, if you will, streamlined it. And that's why we have these two million posters. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any today. So it was Valonis who really made it. He figured it out. He was a silk screen printer. And this is, for those of you who don't know what a silk screen is, I think we're going to do some in this room next week. Oh, yeah, next Monday. But this, is, this is basically a stencil. Now, when you get to silk screens, like here, we've got eight colors. The stencils have to all line up. And that's the hard part. When I was giving a talk at Joshua Tree, I had an artist come out. He brought, he brought about 10 different layers or horizons of a silkscreen print that had 146 colors in it. Just amazing. So it's quite a, a technique. It, it goes back actually to the Chinese and then the Germans. Um, that's where Bologna's coined the word serograph. It was a, from the German and Latin. So that's a stencil of the uh, how, how it made. Today we use a... Cellulite screens, they're photographed, there's emulsions, they, they, they're, we use UV light, and it's a little more modern, but it's essentially the same thing. Each one of these prints here are silk screen printed, exactly like the WPA did. They're handmade, they take one color per day, there's usually six to eight colors, our biggest now is ten, Haleakala. And um, I'll go back for a minute to the Western Museum Laboratories, this is the old bank building that failed in 1929. The, what better to have FDR felt full of starving artists? They got 70 cents an hour, by the way. This is money well spent. I'm going to take you back and introduce you to Elizabeth Geno. And this is uh, her working at her desk, and this is one of her poster prints. Okay, so that's how they were made and where they were made, but who made them? And, and if you look carefully in the seal, we see this EM on the two yellow stones. So these were done together. And Ed Monk or whoever else EM stood for made these, we think. So who's DM? Now here, I'm going to introduce you to DM here. And he's right here. His name is Dale Miller. And this is the fellow that, that had his desk here. That's the Bolognese Press, by the way. But this is Chester Don Powell. He is the fellow that I credit with making these posters. 
he probably did not make the Grand Teton, and he probably did not do the very last one, the 14th. Remember, there were 13 black and white photos, and the 14th slipped through just before the war, and that was Bandelier National Monument. But he likely did the 12 in between. And here he is at his desk. These all have signature, uh, he had signature styling on all these. And I can point that out to you when we maybe do a little walk around the room at the end. But this is Chester Don Powell. He, was, he only weighed 115 pounds. He couldn't join the military in World War I, so he, he worked for the World Organ Company, did their artwork. He ended up on a road crew in the Depression in California. Heard they were building, uh, hiring artists at Berkeley, so he signed up, and, and here he is making our National Park posters. Interesting story. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll digress a bit here with Dale Miller. Dale Miller died in 2005, and for 25 years I've been searching, who, who are these initials? And one day on the internet, about 1991 or two, the name Powell comes up on the internet. Associated with this print, this photograph came up on the internet. And then about a month later, it was taken down again. Well, I caught it. And I have that photograph, but I have a very crude version of it. So somebody had a better copy. So I, I, I know the website, and I had bad dealings with this guy before, so I couldn't really call him. Without, he wouldn't tell me anything. So for, for about 10 years, I never knew who Dale Miller was or Chester Don Powell, any of these people. I had no idea. So finally, when I got the interior exhibit prepping, getting ready for the interior exhibit, a grad student called me. She said, I'm doing my grad work in WPA artists and poster stuff in national parks, and, and can you help me out? I said, I've already written your thesis for you, but you can help me out by finding out who Chester Don Powell is. It's on the internet. Here's the link. I saved it. And so she called this fellow up. And did her thesis, and she sent me a copy of it. And in the thesis was the name of Richard Powell, son of his son. Richard Powell, 75 years old, lived in Elizabethton, Tennessee. Very simple, East Tennesseans. So I flew out there immediately and interviewed him, getting ready for the exhibit. Well, he was very cautious. And he said, well, didn't you come out here and borrow all my family photographs? Didn't you come out here and ask for all these posters that my dad made and all that, you know? And my heart just sank when I heard this. And I said, no, it wasn't me. And he brought these letters out, and they were all signed by Mike. So Mike had passed himself off as me. He'd taken all the family photographs and two original WPA prints and never been seen since. And meanwhile, in 2005, that's just a few years ago, Dale Miller died. And if I'd known that, I could have interviewed him, and I could have gotten the whole story, and I missed it. And it was all because Mike wanted to hide his... his I'm not supposed to use the word theft, but two prints. There's... I wrote Mike and I said, where are these prints? And he said, I donated them to Harper's Ferry uh, Archives and National Park Service, which is what the, the owner wanted. This is Richard Powell. And uh, I, I went out personally to the Harper's Ferry collection. I made three searches, none. And they have an ironclad paper trail. So then I called Mike's ex-wife up. And she said, oh, yeah, I still got them in his house. So they're in Westland, Oregon. I'm going after them. They're yours. They, this is public domain. They belong to you. Yeah. It's just the story of Dale Miller. Go for it. I told Mike, I said, you're going to be famous when I get done with you. This is the best photograph I have, that same one. And this was made in 1940 it was sent around all the parks to sell this concept. This is before the war, so people were focused on, you know, on their future. And this was a, a cool little display, the six steps of silk screen process. Well, after I finished the, 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 the reproduction using the Teton original in, in, the, in black and white photographs, and the Teton original is a template, Parks started finding these, and people started finding them. These originals started turning up. Remember, there's only one, that one back there. So the first person to call me was Tessie Shirakawa. She was chief of the at, uh, at uh, Petrified Forest, and I've been urging all the parks. I said, look for these things. They're out there. You know, Often the parks did not catalog a lot of things. They didn't have staff to do it. They didn't have archivists, some of them. They just sorted the stuff away. So Tessie Shirakawa was the first one. She found this beautiful print. This is what I thought it looked like from black and white photos. Missed it entirely. So I flew down there, took all my inks down with me, and uh, put on my rubber gloves, and the archivist worked with me. And at the end of the day, this is what, what we came up with. Had all these beautiful colors, seven colors in this print. I think that poster is right over behind. It's somewhere here. Yeah, right here. So that's, that's the poster. Beautiful print. And then, uh, this fellow called me, he's a seasonal ranger at Mount Rainier, and he was, like me, cleaning out his, his cabin, and underneath the cabin they were getting ready to move it, and uh, he found two uh, Mount Rainiers. Mm -hmm. And so he called me up all excited, and he been, saw my internet site, and uh, so I said, well, yeah, come on over and, and I'll show you the Teton one, and I said, would you consider selling one of these two prints? And uh, he said, no, I got two sons, and they're both seasonal rangers at Rainier, so, you know, I'm out in the cold. 
<laughs> so I said, well, if you ever find a third one, give me a call. And sure enough, the phone rang a year later, and it was Dwayne Miller, Dwayne uh, uh, Nelson. And Dwayne said, guess what? I found a third one. And it's in its original frame. So I went over there to his house, and here are three prints lying on his kitchen uh, table, none of which I'd seen before. There were three new prints. I said, where did these come from? And he said, I was cleaning the, the glass on the, on the frame, took, took them out of their frame, and there were three prints sandwiched together. So now he's got five prints. So I said, okay, now we're going to talk. <laughs> so this middle one, this is the middle one here. Uh, this today is currently at the Smithsonian Institute and the Postal Museum. So if you're in Washington, go out and see it out there. There's, they're tying together the postal the post stamp, postage stamps to the WPA and then the original photographs. Wow. So this one is part of that exhibit at the Smithsonian right now. The one on the front of this and the back of this we donated to, to then a very young John Jarvis, who is the superintendent of Mount Rainier. He today is the director of the Park Service. And we donated um, to his park, and this one is going to the, this will eventually go into the Harper's Ferry Collection, which is a National Park Archives. So John's, John is, is well aware of this project I'm doing. I'm sorry that we couldn't officially take it on the road. I think we could, could have done a little better, but I mean, here we are, 44. Okay, then uh, 2004 and 5, I went down to Antarctica. I was a dentist for the National Science Foundation. Keep the scientists, scientists down there happy. And, and uh, I get a call in the middle of the, uh, my deployment down there from this guy, Laurent. He's from L.A. And he found two, two prints. So he, he, he wrote me on email. We had a very good email, by the way. But we couldn't mail letters home. And we could not get off the ice. It, it's, it, and I don't know if you follow me. Right now, they're doing a, a rescue at South Pole in the middle of winter. And it's a, it's a big deal going on. It's, uh, so go back and turn on your news. But anyway, I was on, in Antarctica. I couldn't budge. And uh, Laurent calls me. And finally, uh, I said, promise me two things. One is you won't sell these. Hold on to them. And two, you don't split them up. Let me call the parks, and I'll try to get some funding. And what do you want for them? He wanted to sell them. And he wanted $60,000 for, for nine prints. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot to add, he had two prints. I said, go back and find everything. I'm getting ahead of myself here. I said, go back to this junk store and find everything you can about these prints. He's, I said, this, this has been my, my life's uh, uh, big question mark. Where did these come from? Who made it? So he went back to the junk store and he found seven more. Mm -hmm. So he had up with nine original and unique w, WPA prints. Several of them, had, I mean, many of these had never been seen before. Now here's Grand Canyon. If you already knew what that looked like. Here's the first Zion that turned up. This one here's got a crack right down the bottom here. If you look at the Library of Congress website, this is the one in the Library of Congress website. You see that same crack. This one also was purchased by the Library of Congress. This sold. This finally sold at auction. A year after I got off the ice, I took photographs here. I went home, and about a year later, uh, and I, I was trying to get funding up for, for to, to purchase all these, and I couldn't do it. And then finally, the Swan Auction Gallery called me from New York City. And they're the largest poster auction gallery. And he said, are you Ranger Duggan? I said, yep. He said, well, I'm Nick Lowry from the Swan Auction Gallery. And the heart just sank. I, I, I said, oh, he's going to put them up on the auction block. So sure enough, he did. And this one sold for $9,000. Mm -hmm. So they, they're getting valuable. This is in 2006. This was 10 years ago. No one knew what they were. And yet, this one got $9,000. And there were other people bidding against the Library of Congress. Now, I called Brent Carnell, who's, who's, who's the head of the print and photograph collection there. And he, he, he described that the, the government has to have hired bidders. It's very uh, hands-off and secretive. So there were many, many people bidding on this thing. And I was bidding on it, too. But they, they got it. This one went for about $6,000. And then about two years ago, I get a call from a fellow. And again, remember that I recolored posters differently. So the first question out of people's mouths are, I got some originals. And how come mine are different colors than yours? And then the second question out of their mouth is, well, how much are these worth? So these are the two here. Uh, they're in this room. And uh, I purchased these for the auction price that, that Swan sold them for with the promise that I would donate them to the National Park Service. So that was the reason he sold these to me. And if you look right under here, there's two more. Glass and Volcanic with the BM initials. And this is a Fort Marion here. And I don't think you have a Fort Marion here because that's East Coast. It's a Castillo de San Marcos. It's a, it's a originally Spanish fort on, in the Florida coast. So I purchased these two, and uh, when I had a talk, I met with John Jarvis again at at, at, um, at Pasadena. The, the Rose Bowl was the initiation of the National Park Centennial, and John was there, and I got him in my little 48 trailer, and I said, John, we've got to go after these two missing prints. 
and I don't know how to do it. I said, I need your shoulder to the wall with me to the GSA. The GSA works with the FBI in recovering stolen art, the, the Nazi art, whatever you want to name it. They, they go after it. And so John pledged he would, he did. But the rules are, it's just kind of s s information I just learned, but the WP artists, when they made prints, they got to keep three of them. So, but at the same time, that took them remnants of these out of the public domain, because how do you know these three were not privately owned? And indeed, the, the, the ones that Mike took from Richard Powell were probably, I don't know for 100% sure, but probably were his three, one of his three. So anyway, the, here's, um, this is t t on one of the bedrooms. I've got to push the right button here. <laughs> this is the second one that's, this is hanging in the Jenny Lake Museum, except it's under construction right now, so it's at Park Archives at Moose. But this one I purchased from, from Laurent, this Frenchman. And the reason it didn't sell at the, at the Swan Auction Gallery is because they screened this cutout so they could put the campfire program uh, on, uh, just tape it on here. So this, in a way, saved these posters. And if you remember that photograph of Grand Canyon, it had that same little cutout on it. So several of these have showed up like this. In fact, the, I don't think you have Great Smoky Mountain here, but that had a complete cutout on it too. And I just made up rocks to fit in. I didn't know what to, what else can you do? And then here's, notice the coloration uh, on the one that's up in, this is the one in the back of the room, this one, and here's the third one that's really pink. They mixed their inks as they needed it. They, they, were, they were trying to be, save the, 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 they were parsimonious with their ink. But also notice, this is cut off the bottom, it's cut off the side. It took about two inches off. This came up in a plant press from White Sands, New Mexico. So this is simply a piece of cardboard back somewhere in the 40s. So where did this design come from? This, this is, remember the first one done that Dory Yeager sent to uh, Foss Pinkley? And this is, I, mean, I was back last month at the, at the archives. I went through all these, these file drawers. And sure enough, when I was a ranger up at the Jenny Lake Museum, we had a diorama there. It was a beautifully built diorama. And it turns out many, many parks commissioned these dioramas. It took a year and a half to build this. This is the first model they built, sent to the park. It's an actual three-dimensional model. Sent to the park, and they said, yeah, this is what we want. And then and Pretty Off Frixell was the one that was the, he was the consulting geologist on it. Frixell, of course, was one of the first park rangers here. Did many first ascents. He stays at Team Monotonous with this peak right here. He did first ascent on it. So I was excited that, that Frixell was involved with this. And then here's the main one that they built. And this sat in a beautiful case in the Jenny Lake Museum. Well, in, in the course of the years, they reframed windows and doors. They couldn't get this thing back out of the building when they moved it over to the, the Marine. So they cut it in half and, and it went out in pieces. But they took photographs of it, and these are the photographs. But this is the design they used for the Jenny Lake poster. And I don't know who the artist is. There are many fine dioramas in those days, and they, they were very popular. The, how many people have been to the Museum of Natural History in New York City? It, it's full of dioramas, a beautiful new book out called Windows into um, Art or something like that. The, the dioramas are that's my next big mission, is to go out and find all these dioramas, see how many are left. Uh, I've always prided myself as being a backcountry ranger and a mountain rescue guy, and, and I know my mountains and, and I know my canyons and whatnot. So when I went to, in, a, in an effort to find out where the artists sat when they took the, made this Grand Canyon image, I went to the park backcountry rangers in Grand Canyon. Well, they're, they're okay guys, you know, but they're not quite up to the, to the level of the Teton rangers. So I asked them, well, where, where was this poster made? And they said, well, this is fictitious. They, there's no place. So I went to every little, every site in, in the park in 1938 9, figured out where the park roads were, went to all these places in, in the park, and I finally got to the very eastern edge. It's Moran View, and, it, and I, I looked down here, and here's a little sliver river here, and a little spot back in here. This is the bad photograph. And here's that same river, and this same thing here. And there's a, a little bench here, and here it is here. This is where that poster was made. These mounds were put in just for design purposes, so they stumped the rangers in Grand Teton, but they didn't stump ranger dub. <laughs> this was the 14th, or 13 black and white photos. After I got all done publishing, a couple of the originals started turning up. This thing showed up on my doorstep in Alaska. I called Bandelier up, and I said, what's going on here? And they said, oh, we got a WPACCC poster. And I said, how do you know that? They said, well, it says right at the bottom, WPACCC. So I, this was off my radar screen, off everybody's. And I said, well, send it. can you send one up? They said, yeah, we got 13 of them, no problem. I said, 13? Where, how, did you, <laughs> how did you hide these for 50 years, 70, 70 years? And they said, well, we actually had them in the superintendent's office the whole time. 
and then he said, cut in half his cardboard file drawer, file drawer dividers. These were pieces of cardboard. But five of them survived intact. And of course, with computers, we can put them back together anyway. So that print is right here. And uh, it's a beautiful print. If you haven't been a bandolier go there, it's an incredible place. And uh, there's a whole uh, ancient ancestral Pueblo, I think is the current term. But this is all built out and terraced. It, it, incredible. This is the same color, color postcard the artist used. And here I am hot on the trail. I'm going to find out where it is. So where are the posters today? They, 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 we found 41. I found 41. Uh, in the public domain, there's 11. There, there, there are 12 designs, so of course we have redundancies. Here, here are the 12 designs. Wind Cave and Great Smoky still have never turned up, ever. I just spent a month in, in Sevierville, Gatlinburg, uh, Pigeon Forge. Uh, and boy, anybody can spend a month in these towns. It is, <laughs> gets, my, gets my respect. Uh, interesting place. But, and also spent in Spearfish, uh, uh, South Dakota. I, I looked for about a month last year. And I've talked to every historian, junk store, newspapers, old timers, you name it, and nothing, zero. But every poster I've found so far has turned up in California, which is where they were made. Which is probably where we're going to find the rest of these. Uh, here's, there's two Fort Marion's known. Here's the Bandler, the 13 here. There's only single copies of Petrified Forest, Yellowstone Falls, and that is right here. That's the only known copy. And uh, what's the other one here? Yellowstone Falls and uh, Yosemite. Yosemite was one of the nine that Laurent sold at the, at the auction. And it sold for six, five or $6,000. And this $5,000 plus a 20% gallery commission. That's about $6,500, let's say. And the Library of Congress didn't purchase it, so it went to a private party. And it's the only one that slipped between my fingers, and I really regret now that I just, did, just didn't buy it at any price. But I'm looking for a second Yosemite, and I'm looking for these two. And I just put on my website, I've got a $5,000 reward for any one of these three if they're donated back to the National Park Service, and they're in intact condition. So just about any condition if they're intact, $5,000. That's what I'm willing to pay to get, get this set rebuilt. So that will make this 11 go up to what, 14, so we'll have the whole set. In the, in the public domain. And what else is interesting on this thing? These are the ones in the, at the parks. It's the Library of Congress. These are the five that they bought when I was bidding against them. This is the Harper's Ferry Collection, which has one bandolier, which I sent. I had six of these originals, by the way, when I started this talk. I've got two today, here and here, but there's the other two are here, and, and the third, or the fifth and sixth are in the Smithsonian and in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Harper's Ferry Collection. So, Relinquishing it. This, the, these are the Mount Rainiers that, 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 that Dale Miller, I mean, uh, Dwayne Nelson <coughs> found. Let's see, these are the two that are, that are taken from the artist's son that I'm trying to get back. So that's where they are today. Okay, I'm going to just briefly go into some of the other uh, contemporary editions. After, after I finished the 14 historical parks, national parks came to me. The first was, was uh, Bell's Tower, Deb Leggett was the superintendent there. She, takes me over to the side at, at, at a meeting, I can't remember, it was at, at Devil's Tower, and she, she motions me over and she says, hey, you make a potion, it kind of looks like it fits into the WPA style, and, and uh, nobody will ever know, and I said, absolutely. So this was in 1995, or six even, and the problem is we didn't have good computers. We had computers, but we did not have good graphics. So I had to actually make a painting, so I actually did this, I, I, I did that. I felt it pens, and I drew it all out, then we had a painting made, just like the WPA artists did. They had to make their own painting, then they had to trace the painting, and then from those tracings, we made the screen. So it's done exactly like they did that back in 1938. And it was actually pretty straightforward. And we made a great print. I think it is back way over in the corner here in the back. And then, uh, these are just some of the, the uh, contemporary designs. I'll just take a few through a couple here. Uh, the very first thing I did after the after the, uh, this handmade one, I hired an artist named Brian Mabius. And Brian's a former park ranger. He worked for Dinosaur and Badlands. And he sent me a couple of pictures that he made for his, for his kids. He's from Texas. This is one of our, um, he made that. Uh, it's got, we like to bring in the CCC buildings. This is the, uh, I think they're the Hacienda Cottages. <coughs> Teddy Roosevelt stayed there, I believe. Maybe not. I think he's dead then, actually. F maybe FDR stayed there. Somebody did. He sent me these two prints. And he said, you know, you could make these for every, every park in the park system. 
And I, I, said, well, I already figured that out. And I said, why don't you come work for me someday because I'm getting ready to launch on some of these, these newer parks. And uh, so the first, first one we did that was with a computer was Bryce Canyon. And I think there's Bryce Canyon right there. Well, you, you know, you think that, well, computers are going to make this easy. Absolutely not. It's, this really was difficult. Uh, and I was absolutely surprised. We had some very major issues. The first one was how do you get a photograph? You can always posterize it in a program, but how do you get the screens traced out? If with the black and white photos, I had to trace all these screens, there about 100 of them, based on gray, no colors. That's what took me, it took, by the way, it took me five years and $150,000 just, just to create the originals. Five years, $150,000. I funded it through sales of each successive part. Well, here we are on a, on a computer, and but how do you get this on a on screens? Well, you have to draw it out. Well, so, so Brian spends 13,000 mouse clicks. He, this is what it looks like. Well, this was this was just not profitable. Brian threw his hands up and said, "You know, I, I just can't do this." And and the, the profitability really wasn't there. We tried to keep keep the prices, you know, down for the for the visitor park visitor. By the way, we have not raised these prices in 15 years. You still buy it. Eight color, ten color now, for for forty dollars at the park bookstore. We still wholesale for twenty dollars at the park. Ten color print. So anyway, this was, this was the first problem we ran into, and how we solved it. They now have a stylus, and you can actually trace the screen. This is this is that print right there, and we took it in and we made perfect copies of before this one, and that one went into the department interior exhibit. We made perfect copies of these, and we're selling these here at the at the gift store. Yep. They're hundred dollars for hundred years, and they're signed by EM. We put the EM initials back in for a thousand copies, and I've signed them and numbered them, and uh, they're available at the gift store. So anyway, this is stylus, and then the third, the second thing that we really had problems with is color. Now you think this would be easy because you can switch colors on a computer very quickly, and that's true. But when you switch one color, the other seven go completely crazy. And Brian and I spent two months before we came up with this combination here. That first one you saw was the first. First edition we did, usually first editions are, have a little more value, not these. So we finally decided, we, we finally decided on this color scheme. This was, this was much more difficult than we thought. The third problem we had was fonts. There are no font, fonts available online. There, there are no font programs. When we make a poster from, for Olympic in this case, it took as long to make the fonts as it did to make the design. So we were kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. So it, 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 when, we, when we got to the part of interior, all this we could type out in minutes because we, got into, we had a font building program called Fontographer. So we put this in a WPA font and uh, within a year, Bill Gates came out with a NPS 1935. If you go home to your computer today and look in your font drawer, you can see the WPA font. And mine's better, by the way. <laughs> it did not do a good job. And then this is... Uh, Let's take you through it. One, one design from beginning to end. I went down to Hawaii, found this old landslide in 1923. 1924 was the, last, was the first eruption of a 75 year eruption sequence. And uh, so I made a sketch and see why I hired Brian. And I laid it all the colors and kind of where I wanted to lay out. So Brian would make a sketch and send it back to me on email. And then we'd, I'd call him up and say, well, let's change this, move that, and add some lava in. And, and we go back and forth and back and forth about for months. And we'd have maybe 50 to 100 of these different designs. This is what we ended up with. It's a split fountain sky, so it goes from orange to yellow. So this fades uh, in color. It kind of makes it unique. And this is how the, um, well, this is the general grant. So I, again, I talked to Brian and said, I want to use the, the, the lighting of the trees to, to set the the general grant tree back. Is it, how do you do a tree? Make it look really big. So I, so this time Brian makes a sketch. And this is what the screen printer sees. This is the first color that goes down. And the second. And the third. But who would know? How, how would you figure this out? And this is the final. Seven, seven color screen. And there's the one we started with. Just for effect. So this is the Badlands that Brian sent me. This is what we came up with later. These are some of the contemporaries. And then here's the uh, dinosaur. And here is the final. 
This is what Brian usually presents this. That's pretty much my talk. This is a, I started with two slides of Alaska. I'm going to end with two slides. This is Alaska, March 6th. Should be ice all the way out. None. There's no ice flows. Polar bears have nowhere to go. They're hunting along the coastline. What happens? They run into villages. And four hours later, that bear was killed. Th th these are my little patients. Never patient. You can tell them they've got candy all around their mouths. <laughs> and uh, cute little kids. And really sweet kids. And I always end with this slide. This is Marty and Alice. Mary, nobody, knows inter nobody needs introductions in this valley. But anyway, Marty was a real inspiration to, to me. I knew her right up until she died at 101. We were for 35 years. Um, and she is a great lady, and so is Olas. And since I'm Alaskan, I had to end with that one. I'm going to take questions. Um, if you'd like, I'd do a little walk around and walk about. There's free stickers on the back table. Uh, some business cards if you want to contact me or have questions later. Um, Virtually everything I've talked about is online. Uh, questions? Thank you for coming, by the way. Were they, yes, sir. You, were they all this size? Yes, sir. The originals were this size? You know, that's interesting uh, you bring that up because remember I'm working for black and white photos and I have a poster. It's, 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 it's on 14 by 20 board with a quarter of an inch border. If you, if you measure here, th this poster will come out 13 and a half. By 19 and a half. But when I worked from the black and white photos, we didn't have computers, so I couldn't correct two axes. I could only correct one. So I made all the widths 13 and a half, and the height ran whichever way the negative did, because we had to blow these up at a, at a uh, Photoshop. Uh, not, not a Photoshop program, a shop that, that did photo, photos. So all the posters that I reproduced, the first 14, all had different heights, and a drive frame was crazy. To, to redraw those screens, I have to start over completely from scratch. And I, I may do that sometime in the future. I may even try to get a grant for it and just get, get some art students on it. Because I think these, I, th these should be put back into a you know, computerized, accurate file. Now, this one we redrawn. The two back here we've redrawn perfectly. The glacier still has problems. Um, the, the Yosemite, is, we still have problems with that one. This, we have problems with that one. We're talking a, a, an eighth of an inch to maybe a quarter of an inch. But, but they all have a little bit of different. But we, we print them all today, all the contemporary ones we print at a standard size. I think it's 13 and a half by 19 and a half. You have to decide, right. well, how do you decide to uh, change the original colors? Or, you know, do, does anybody ever ask you, hey, we want the original? We, you know, I, I've republished some of my, uh, my colorations back to the originals. And, but here's an interesting story. Where's the... Um, Let's see, this, uh, th this one here, I'm going to keep this laser on people's eyes, but this one is my coloration. We sell it 10 to 1 to the original. Yeah. People like it. They want bolder colors, and we've gone to bolder colors. If you look at Saguaro, two, two to the right of it, yeah. compared to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. We, we've gone a lot more bolder in colors than, mm -hmm. than the WP artists did. And I don't know whether it's just the palettes of the day or whether they had, that was the house paint they used or whatever they used, mm -hmm. but I've always gone brighter, and, and, uh, and it seems to work. But we do offer the original WPA colors, and we offer the, my original my original colors. So, so both are offered. Yeah, and then some we like Lass and Volcanic, which I think is way in the back, right there. That, that that was I think this one here was the last one made. This one here, and <coughs> this was pink, brown, yellow, puce, and some other horrible color. And I think that I always thought that was the last one because these were the last colors they had on the shelf. And they were the worst. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I recolored this. Well, I colored this one from black and white actually twice. I didn't like my first colorations either, so I changed it to more blue and green. And then when the original showed up, there were only two known of those. They are both this gaudy color, and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so if, if anybody wants to do it, that's, it's up to them. Cool. Awesome. Feel free to come up and, and look closely at these. Uh, so you can take pictures of them if you like. Um,